Hello, everybody. It's a special holiday edition of The Climb. The Climb is brought to you by the Digital Mastermind Group. And if you haven't listened before, the show is live. It's about journeys. It's a podcast where we talk to digital agencies about business, technology. So if you want all the latest tips, tricks, tools, mentorship, peer group, essentially a tribe of digital agency owners that come together to help each other out, then this is the show and we have the group for you. So grow your agency. Come on and join me. Subscribe to this podcast and shoot me an email, john, j-o-n at digitalmastermind.com with any questions you have or if you would like to join our group, we'd love to have you. And today is a special podcast, not for any other reason than it's what most people in this business want to do, and it's about scaling. And today we're going to, it's going to be conversational. It'll be with Dave, my business partner, and I, as we talk through some of the scaling problems that we've had, maybe even some of the ones that we are having, and figure out a way that will be beneficial for us as well as anybody else that's listening. So Dave, why don't you come out here, buddy, on a special holiday edition of uh, Veterans Day here at The Climb? Yeah. Yeah, it's... uh... Awesome uh, to to honor our veterans and anyone that served. Uh, that's always a thank you. Thank you for your service. Red, white, and blue. That's right. Yeah, I don't know. Put this shirt on really early this morning. Didn't uh, just wasn't wasn't thinking the first hour in the morning. Yeah, yeah. Didn't, a lot. didn't get the memo. But as far as scaling uh, is concerned, what was the first scaling issue you remember running into? Uh, we t- kind of touched on it last week um, with the interview with Carl Sagers of just when I was necessary or mandatory, you know, mm-hmm. and, and everything was running through me. That's you can't scale like that. Um, it's impossible to scale like that. So you, the first challenge you have to solve to scale is to make yourself optional or not mandatory. Mine was capacity issues. We had three projects land at one time. And I, I, in the proposal, it just said they were all going to be done in like, you know, eight to 12 weeks. Well, they all landed at eight to 12 weeks and they all had the same emergency. So that was the first time we realized like, okay, this is, this is a scaling issue. And essentially how I solved it was just discounting one and then we were able to knock out the other two and then learning i didn't necessarily have to to discount i just needed to put something in my contract that says if signed by this date and then just watch essentially our capacity based on sales that are coming in yeah early in our in in our career i would say we ran into that quite a bit but we just juggled you know and uh, you know back then i put a lot of hours in after work to make those happen um so did the team but we would just you know constantly juggle always showing the client some progress like we couldn't just ignore one client but we just had to keep bouncing like once once we got them a little progress you know like all right we got to go get some something on this client and you know and we and we hustled to try to make sure that we could still you know get everything done on time um and you know and manage the situation with a little account management and, and you know if it's eight to 12 weeks and we did it in 14 weeks yeah we were a little bit behind but we still got it done and, and if it was managed properly you know clients for the most part didn't mind it so I think the issue arises with, with that is when there's like deadlines for people like launching things, right? By right. recall, one was a, a restaurant opening and I, I can't recall what the, the other two were. And like this guy, rightfully so, needed his website up. But sure. without doing that and managing, you're going to, and I'm sure you ran into this, like at what point did you realize you were burning your team out? Oh, I mean, absolutely. You know, it's immediately. You know, people, <laughs> you know, it's more very vocal, right? Yeah. You know, they're, they're, you can tell it, it's written in there, you know, in every communication, you can hear it and you can feel it. And so, so you have to play cheerleader and, you know, you have to, you know, talk them through it and, and try to understand with them and, and, you know, but it's for the good of the company and, and we were small. So it was like, Hey, we're building something here. So I think that communication loop is is necessary, but there's also trust in your team when they say that they're underwater, right? You have to trust and realize like, okay, I have to pull some of this off. So I'd say it's one of the main, and it, it sounds like one of those continual like business 
tenants that just circles around over and over again, communication, 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 communication. But it's, right. it's true, right? You need to be able to understand from your team and, and trust them like, okay, where are you guys at? You know, how long is this going to take? And then I know when people are burned out, they take way longer. They make the, the make worst mistakes. mistakes. Oh, yeah. And if you want to deliver on what you're promised, essentially, and one of our promises is, all right, we want to be the easiest company to work with. But at the same time, we also want to be the most profitable company, right? So that means accuracy is necessary. And of course, mistakes get made. Sure. But having that feedback loop with the team is, is important because... If not, then people are just going to continue to make mistakes. People are going to get fired. Uh, people are going to quit. So that's something that I recommend to all companies to continually do one-on-one -on -one check ins, which is something that we do, as well as in team meetings and monitor, like you say. All right, where where are places that you need to cheerlead? Yeah, uh, and there's times where I hate having to be a cheerleader. Like, why why do people need a cheerleader? But I mean. It's <laughs> It's something that you have to do every once in a while. Everybody goes gets in ruts and stuff like that. So, uh, but in regards to scaling, like you know, if you get, you, you're not going to turn away three projects, right? So you're going to take them all. Yep. And I guess if you had an overflow partner, you could tap into that so that you can offload some things. Um, but are you going to hire a brand new resource for two eight to twelve week projects to try to alleviate? Like I, to me, I think that's. You just got to buckle down and, and plow through those projects and you can solve the scaling issue after, but trying to inject a new person then uh, causes more stress. Yeah, I don't even know how you could do that. You can't buy your way out of that problem. All you're doing is just adding more confusion to it, but it feels like it's the easiest solution because it's just, oh, it's a number of units of bodies. We add one, everything gets better. Yeah, that never works out. That's no. never the answer, and you actually, you know, throw, it's like throwing, it's like throwing a, you know, a, a firecracker in the middle of a crowd because your team is like, all right, I've got these things I need to do, and then oh wait, I got to train somebody now, I got to onboard somebody now, I got to set up their email, I've got to you know get them credit. Like you're just messing up my workflow, and then that's your already trained, efficient resource that you just derailed uh, to try to get a project done. So. You know, I always I always tell my team when we're in the middle of the storm, you got to ride the storm out and then then we'll address hiring somebody after. And then their natural reaction is always, yeah, right, we're not going to hire somebody. And we we actually do try to do that, but I only like to onboard people during times of calm. Because of hiring them during stressful periods, A, they might just quit and they might, you know, not stick around, but B, you're just derailing it but everything. Yeah, I agree with that. I, and but I know for for lo lots of companies and then even us that after like a project, the evaluation, it's kind of like, yeah, hey, I remember this from this project, but there's no like formal like, all right, hey, this is this is where we went wrong. This is where we won. And I've heard of companies doing this and I've just never been a part of it. Like we've had the conversation like, ah, where'd we go wrong? Right. But it's not necessarily like, OK, really looking into everything pinpoint by pinpoint. I would love to hear from somebody if they have a process like that. I think that would be really intriguing to to dig into. And I and, and it's out there. But I know some super successful companies that just, all right, they take like the little points. All right, where do we go wrong in an assessment? And they move forward. And I think that's essentially the path that we're on. But if somebody has this formal analysis or evaluation, I'd, I'd love to hear about it. Got our first show comment already. Jennifer. A frequent fan of our show here. How are you? Yeah. How are you guys overcoming burnout? And she follows that up with, with everything going on, it seems more prevalent these days. Yeah, I don't leave my house. I don't watch television. <laughs> uh, so one of the things that we've talked about this on the show, like every morning, I, I meditate for ten minutes. And sometimes it's it's just awful because everything is just flooding your mind. Sometimes it's actually it's it's nice, but it's never absolutely amazing because it's this thing you got to do first thing in the morning. So I believe that that's one of the things that that helps me out. Also, I, I create lists. I do a brain dump. All the things that are bothering me, I'll I'll list those out. And then I'm also I'm really direct, sometimes too direct. Um, so I always try to use the language of being gentle and direct. So if something is bothering me, I try to to voice it uh, voice it out. And then one other thing I haven't done. Is uh is take up therapy and actually if you listen to the full 
episode of the interview with Carl Sakis, he has a ton of great tips on how to find a therapist that I'll take up. But mine, I would just to, to sum it up, would be essentially meditation, um, watching what I consume, and then you know being being direct so other people know how I feel. Yeah, um, you know, I rarely, I rarely get burnout. Um, and I don't know. I guess you, exactly though. But how do you manage it? So that's what I'm saying. I'm I'm managing burnout. When I get burnout, I mean, you're in burnout. Like it's too late. So like, what are the routines that protect you from getting burnout? Well, this show for one. I mean, this, you know, this is a form of therapy right here. Yeah. Uh, telling people what's going on and and what we're doing. Um, you know, I don't know. It's been a while. Like. Uh, you know, it's been, I didn't really get that seasonal burnout, uh, in, in fall, like we typically get. And then the DMG conference saves us. I didn't get that this, uh, fall. So I don't know. Uh, you know, I think, I think we've achieved kind of like a, the magic number where like we actually have some resources that are on the bench. So it's, we, we haven't had super stressful, you know, go, go, go in a while. So nobody's like, freaking out you know i just planned our christmas party i'm super excited to like celebrate with everyone um but then again shit are we gonna go back into is everything getting locked down again is our is our christmas plan about to get destroyed um that would you know completely change everything but no i don't i you know i'm, I'm just i think we've had a good solid year and um and it hasn't been like super stressful and we've gotten a lot of good feedback from clients so that's I, that really is like a cure for burnout is when like your clients are saying how, you know, like, thank you. And, and the clutch reviews and stuff. And it's like, wow, this is, we're, we're doing good work. Sales cures all. It does. It definitely does. Yeah. So I think maybe that's why I'm, I'm struggling on the burnout side. That's my responsibility. <laughs> I mean, yeah, pipeline looks pretty, uh, pretty renewed yeah. this week. It is. And I think that's also uh, one of the things, too, uh, to, to that question is just the, the conversations you have with yourself, right? It's just, all right, because it's Q4, so this is this is go time in, in, a, in a COVID year. I speak to sure. a lot of agency owners, so I think it's, yeah, just, just keep your head up high and stick with your routine. But let's tie it back to the show uh, message, like burnout. When you are having scaling issues, that's what leads to burnout constantly because you're trying to scale. If it works, great, but then you are you have to t tackle scaling issue. If it doesn't work, you double down on your stress and you burn out even faster. I mean, when you're trying to scale and you are taking on new sales, or, or let's start with this. John, when you were building your agency, and did you hire before you went after projects or did you get the project and then hire? Get the project and then hire. Of course. Every business owner is going to say that. But every employee wants to do it the other way around. Mm -hmm. They're like, all we need is this employee, and then we can go get these projects. Mm -hmm. And nobody's going to invest in that before, at least on the smaller scale agency. If you're large and you've got an R&D budget or you you know, you know got that capital that you can develop the market, sure. But most people, and especially the people watching our show, are not in that position. So you're going to go sell before you hire. Um, what happens when you're in a uh, employer mar employee market and you're not finding the resources? I've been in that situation. And you can't get that person in, but you've already got the signed deal. That's a tough situation. That That is stressful. Stressful as can be. And it instantly amps up your employee's stress level too. I think it's one of the worst situations because you close the deal. You sh somebody trusted you enough to essentially say, "All right, I'm going to sign on this contract. I'm going to give you money," and then you want to go ahead and deliver, and it's that capacity issue where you can't. So you're like, "Bye." Yeah, it just fades away, and that's just terrible. It's like, oh wow, like we did everything up to the point, and we couldn't even execute. couldn't execute. We couldn't have the team. All right. So that's why, like, we're we're working on a deal right now that um. You know, one of our sales guys said, uh, you know, we might need uh, 20 people. I'm like, get the deal signed. I'll figure out how to get 20 people like that. That'll be my challenge. But d definitely don't not go after it. You know, yeah, so, I think that comes into like visibility and communication. Right. So if we're visible based on we know what our capacity is. And then as far as the, the communication with the client, like, all right, hey, let's let's go ahead and scale this up, because if you overpromise. Just like, yeah, I mean, there, there are no controls in place if you just hire 20 people and the project goes away. It's, yeah, that's yeah, it's a lot of people. Firing 20 people. Right. 
Yeah, so. that's what agencies that have like big accounts where it's like you're specific to an account. When that account goes away, it's it's rare for anybody under the top level leadership to, to stay. And even in most cases, the top level leadership on that account is going to fade away as well. And I would ask the entrepreneur, do you really want to own a business that's beholden to, I mean, you, t- you typically want to be your own boss because you don't want to have to. And, and I get it. All clients are basically your boss. But when you have a client that's 60% of your revenue, that's really your boss. You know, that's that's dangerous. Yeah. yeah. I don't recommend that. The rule right. is so might, no more than 20. Yeah. So if you want to feel good about it, you know, 10, because yeah, I mean, 20 is a lot. Their email comes in, your heart rate might go up 10, a little bit lower when they're like, you know, between two and 5%. You're like, oh, that's cool. It's just a very friendly conversation. All right. So, you know, what was your um, biggest scaling mistake that you ever made? Biggest scaling, we took on a large real estate project and uh, then we rapidly had to put the team around it. And I realized that a lot of the, the, the infrastructure that I had was all on me. I was completely mandatory. We, uh, I, there, there was an art director that was on the project that just, he put it this way, there was a sign that was supposed to be horizontal Okay. And he ordered it vertical. Ugh. And the building that it was going to go on, I think, I don't know, it's like I don't know, 30 stories, maybe 40 stories. I don't know. But it was so long that you put it at the top and it hit the bottom. Like it was like hundreds of feet long, like hundreds. And it was way, way too long. And it was just one issue after after the next. It was just crazy. People... Just uh, media buys that made absolutely no sense. And there was a plan too that just it just didn't seem like anybody was following it. Um, and then some people had personal issues. So w- what I realized there is that's where I had to get into like okay, like what is the promise? What is what is it that we deliver? Some people call it purpose, mission, whatnot. Get everybody on the same page. The good news is we blew it out of the park. We gave them more leads than they knew what to do with, but. The, the pain that came from all of that, it was it was a scaling issue. We literally took on our absolute largest account with deadlines that this thing had to be done within like 45 days and we were crushing it, but at the cost of sanity and the scar tissue too, right? Because when you go into right. one of those situations, it's so horribly painful. You're going to be so timid when you see those things again, whether you learn and what you, you know do before. Um, and that's something that people need to take into account. Hundred percent. Yeah. But if I was to say, you know, would I, you know, would I do it again? I think I'd absolutely do it again. Oh Um, yeah. But I I do it through uh, a more honest lens with the team, not in not cheerleading and like, oh yeah, yeah, you guys can do that because I think some of that was on me. It was Mm -hmm. like, yeah, you are completely incapable of doing this. (laughs) You are not going to work on this project. Where. something I say a lot now, hope is not a strategy. Yeah. There was a little bit of hope there and, uh, yeah, that didn't work out. Yeah. I actually really like that saying, um, yeah, scaling issues. I mean, I've talked about it a million times, but mine was just letting a client become 80% of revenue and seeing the, uh, telltale signs of them not being able to pay their bill and then causing just, just a terrible issue. But like, did they yeah. use that to their advantage? Did they know that they were your your biggest client? Yeah, I mean, and so uh, on a on a core personal level, I had to take it as like the ultimate attack on my being because they knew they couldn't pay and they were doubling their order. So their life and investment was far more important to them than me or my team. That and. A lot of people won't look at it at that level, but I mean, he risked me over him and that is what like was personally insulting. So still good friends with the client and we actually, they came back and became a long time client, but there was always scar tissue there from that. And it changed our relationship and our contracts and, you know, everything about that account was all prepaid up front. Uh, and you know, uh, stern warnings the second they would go over net 30. So, so what but, advice would you give to an agency that finds themselves in a position of, uh, of 80, 80%? I've never been anywhere near that. I've never I mean, been to 30. 
I bet you many agencies when just starting out, I mean, think about it. Your first client is a hundred percent of your revenue, right? So you're, you're going to be in this situation early in your agency life. Mm -hmm. It's after you get through it a couple, you know, after you're kind of in it and you've got employees that are relying on you, that's when the risk really happens and, and starts to build. So if you're at that level, I mean, you just have to have the contracts. Don't, you know, it's easy to say, oh, no, I've been working with them for three years. They, we've grown up together. We've, you know, he's helped me build my business. Um, you can't trust that. You have to have the guide rails in place. And even then, are you really going to sue somebody or take them to court? I mean, while your business just got destroyed and your cash flows disappeared? I mean, are, do you have the resources to go to court? So, um, you have, yeah, it's tough. And, and you, you don't have, want to go through court. No, Nobody wants to do you that. want to trust your gut. And if it's time to cut off the spigot, you got to do it, you know, and you got to tell them, Hey, we got to slow down. We just had this happen with a client. I knew something was going on. I could see the signs. And it finally, we just issued the warning and said, all right, we're, we're stop, you know, working. And then of course, got them on the phone. Couldn't get them on the phone for two months. They would not re return an email, would not return a call. And then magically, when we said, all right, we're going to stop service, they call, explain the situation. I said, I knew this, I knew something was going on, but a partner calls me in advance and lets me know and works with me and asks me to work with them. And we figure it out and create a, you know, a path forward. And when I said it like that, the client was like, I'm sorry. And then, cause his, his default was to hide because he couldn't pay at the moment. And I understand that. And and I understand their, 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 their circumstances are calling for something else. But I was like, you need to work to have communication. Because without that, I think you're just trying to screw me over. Especially in the relationship where the leverage is flipped, right? right. Where it's, all right, you're in debt. Now you need to speak to the debtor. It's essentially credit card management 101. If you can't pay your bill, communicate and everything will be okay. The moment you stop communicating, things go sideways. I think it's also that vendor relationship. There are just some people that want to treat the people that they work with as a vendor. Yeah. They, don't, they don't want partnerships, you know? Correct. And with that, it's it's hard. But you, you're no matter what, no agency is going to have a relationship where everybody is like blissful in partnerships. I, you know, a few Correct. years ago, there was this kind of air about that where it was the the bean bags and the pinball machines and the right. cool offices and we only work with people we like and all that. Yeah, a lot of that people are getting rid of those offices and they're also realizing, yeah, unfortunately, there's going to be accounts that you're you're not going to be happy with everything that's on there. And sometimes it's going to be the people that you're working with. Now, granted, if they go against your values, that's a different story, but sure. they may they may look at you differently. Yeah. And and that's a part of scaling, right? Because I remember when we were at 30 percent, that account was beginning to grow. My instant reaction was that this like the situation that you were talking about the the personal side was i need to fill up more accounts just so i'm mentally in a place where i can manage the company better otherwise we're leveraged by this account correct and it's 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 a bad situation not that we don't go above and beyond in all cases but i don't like the fact that they can essentially just pull you know the the, the string whenever they want and essentially dictate, you know, where we go and, and how we do it. Yeah. Would, I would even say now, if somebody had a project, we haven't run into this yet, which that would become like, you know, 80 to 100% of revenue. That would be something that I would say, no, we have to scale this in because if we were to take this on, it would absolutely crush us. Well, at our level right now, yeah, there's no way we could, that, I mean, taking on a, I mean, I don't know. First of all, it's, if somebody came in with a multi-million dollar project, I'm, I'm probably going to take <laughs> this it. This is the thing. It's the shiny thing, right? You're like, oh, that's, but that's we would scale shiny. it. That's big. That's, uh, you know. Oh, dude, that's as shiny as it gets, man. That's yeah. it. Yeah. We're like, oh, yeah, you know, just, oh, we're wooing them. But yeah. if it were to essentially crush, we would have to scale it. There's no way that we could just take on something that is equal to our revenue. Well, what I would do is we would have to build a new team completely new team you know you couldn't roll that into the right work. you would just have to say all right we're creating a new division and going from there and then we can you know promote people into the new group or something like that but but yeah that would be ridiculous but that's ridiculous i mean nobody's coming in with a hundred percent of our revenue project but for a good example like a 25 percent um you know i got oh, some of those in the pipeline right now you know, and actually, uh, Jennifer just mentioned uh, she wants in on that. That's actually a good option is that you could actually find 
a company to merge with to take on that project that can give you that instant scale. Absolutely. Mastermind group. We yeah. pass around projects in there all the time. So 100%. absolutely. And it's not necessarily someone feeding for sales. It's just like, hey, I, I gave one to Jennifer the other day. Right. I don't, I don't know if anything happened with it. Yeah. I hope so. But yeah, finding like, uh, you know, partnerships that you have, like similar companies or, or, or specialists that can tackle parts of it so that you can um, take on the project. That's a great op, you know, option for, you know, adding scalability. We tell our clients all the time that we're a, a valuable overflow resource so that if you do run into grabbing that big project, then we can come in and help you scale. We've done that numerous times, especially when something's outside of somebody's depth and they just have no concept of like how to move forward. That's something that we've helped out with for sure. My favorite way to help companies scale from a business to business perspective is instead of helping them take on the new project, let us take on all your old maintenance projects so your people can tackle the new project. A lot of people don't think of that. A lot of people think when they partner with a company, it's always about how can they help me with a new project? Well, your people inside your shop should be focused on the new wow. And the stuff that you have on autopilot that's in maintenance mode that's not required, you know, the, the level of attention, that's what you need to outsource or get some, you know, overflow scale uh, options for. So, although I agree with that, I notice most companies, especially agencies, don't realize what it is that they're actually good at and what they should target and what they should sell it's 100 percent. it's amazing it's just like oh yeah we want this thing over here it's like yeah you don't know anything about that you you have no reason to even get that business so why don't you just focus on this over here and those conversations sometimes they're well received sometimes they're not but i think there's this especially in this business and i know we've talked about this numerous times everybody's looking at what somebody else is doing Sure. And because they're looking at it, they think that they they also deserve that business or they're, they're entitled or that they, they should get it. There's that kind of missing earned part of it. Yeah. Well, I mean, for me, I've always looked at that as just uh, experience. How, how long you've been in business? Like I, when, when we were three years old, I knew we weren't going to be working with brands like Nike or Microsoft. Like when I hear when I hear small businesses and they've got, you know, uh, all these um, logos, they've you know, an agency's been open for two years and they've got all these logos of Fortune 500 companies on their website. I'm like, how the did you get that? Do you remember that strip? Like it was like Kraft Foods in there and like everybody had like this same strip. It's just as soon as I saw it, I knew it was BS. But everybody else that was outside of the space, they didn't know any better. They would work with those companies and they would get, you know, shit on. But I think most of the time it's yeah, they worked with Kraft. Because Kraft had a booth at you know some local charity event, and then no, they bought the like, cheese from the grocery store or that. So, but it's just I knew at those times that I wasn't going to be cap. I wouldn't even try. Like they don't, they're not going to work with us. Stop trying to do that. We have there is a you know a rhythm of business if done right and if done in a slow, consistent growth manner, you'll get there. But if you try to leapfrog, that's when you can leapfrog right off a cliff. You know, if you, and so I have a slow, right a car, steady right. growth. What was that? Right in front of a car. Yeah. I mean, I'm always about slow, steady growth. You never need to, to reach. Uh, and I, I think love everybody that. has that, that nightmare project that they worked on. Some places people worked on them for years or months. There was one where we lost like $200,000 on a project. And that is a big learning experience. Like, okay, well, what, what, speaking about like, what did we learn? I learned a lot of things in that one. You never let in an expert that, uh, that you haven't worked with before after your scope is signed. So if they're like, oh, hey, we're bringing in, you know, Carl and Carl is the aforementioned expert at plugins or whatever that thing is right. like, no, 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 that wasn't a part of our scope. It's not that we don't like Carl. But Carl can go fuck himself because we're not losing two hundred thousand dollars because you guys wanted to see that. Like that has to be a serious conversation, or we're completely changing the scope because, uh, yeah, it, it, it was a horrible situation that we got put into and couldn't get out of it. They threatened legal action, so we had to deliver on it, and because that's what our contract said. So I always call that the poison pill effect um, when working with clients, and I get that from uh, NFL 
salary cap contract negotiations. And when an NFL team with a free agent that is a restricted free agent is looking to, you know, exercise his right to be a free agent, another team can put what's in the contract called a poison pill, which is a clause that they know the other team can't match. So it's making the decision for them. The other team cannot, you know, uh, keep them. And so they have to go. And teams know what the contracts are. The, you know, the, the contracts are public, so they'll, they'll put a poison pill in there and destroy it. Now, the same thing with the clients that have these experts on. Like, I hate when they hire a new person, and you can tell they've, they've been in the industry for two years, and then they're trying to tell us what a WordPress site costs. Yep, absolutely. Like, I looked it up online. Guys, I'm, I'm a GTS expert. <laughs> right. Or they say, like, they're using a template. Why? You know, like, no shit. So, so does everyone. I mean, everyone uses a framework. Everyone uses a, you know, something. There's also nuances to template because if you're outside of a custom build design, well, guys, I mean, you, you want to party like a rock star on a, you know, washing machine's budget. Like, it's not going to work. Like, right. you got to you gotta use a template. You want me to hand write, hand code your content management system as well from scratch? Or are you okay right. using a pre-built, you know, content management system? So, but these, you know, I've, I've, I've been in numerous instances where the client is like fighting me because, or some new person, and it always ends up bad. Yep. It, it it rarely ends up in you can convincing this other person, and it's usually like a mom and pop, and someone's brother or cousin is you know kicking in opinions. So, but you learned the hard way too, right? Yeah. Like I did, yeah. And it's the same thing. And then now I have that story. So I think this is for anybody in sales. Like sales stories are really important because when that arises. That's 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 how you scale a sales team and scale your sales ability. I will literally tell that story. Nope, we had Carl, the plugin guy, came in on a lot and a large, you know, web build. We lost a couple hundred thousand dollars. So if we're going to have that, we need to make sure that that's going to be an addendum in agreement. Are we going to run into that? No, 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 no. So we have our team. And also, you said the marketing person that gets hired. Um, I think it's important to look up the people you're working with because in the history of titles, the most bastardized one of all time is marketing director. Yeah, of course. You know, whether it's, you know, it's like, oh, Timmy, oh, yeah, dude, Timmy looks sharp. Yeah, man, he's been our receptionist for uh, for like, you know, six months. Right. You know, he's done some marketing things. He put together an email list on Microsoft Publisher. Yeah, you know what? Let's give him the title marketing director. We need, right. we need somebody in our marketing department. And that's the person that you're gonna have to work with. And, and when that person has insecurities, there's undermining that happens. And that's the worst when you right. have an enemy on your team that has more leverage than you do when you're only trying to do the best for that client. The outcomes are not going to scale. Correct. Jennifer's got another great comment. Um, agency owners need to get over the fact that they can't be everything to everyone. So going back to your comment that you were just saying about um, don't sell stuff you're not good at. You know, don't try to go after everything. Sometimes you do have to partner up. Now, it's scary when a, a client does go outside of you for something that's similar or close. But if you're not truly great at it, then you need to pivot really quickly on how do I best work with this new resource so we can actually create a really good relationship so you're even locked into, you know, the ecosystem even stronger. Now, if that other company's coming in trying to edge you out that's eh, a different situation but um you know make sure that because a quick way to lose your client is to say that you can do other things and you suck at them yeah people people can smell bullshit right yeah. and it's easy to tell like all right this doesn't feel right and if somebody that is is a professional at what they do all right well they're going to take the patterns that you're giving them it's like all right well this, this doesn't make sense right so i agree with that and i think it's also the larger the companies you're going to work with, the more partners they're going to have. And it also depends on the diversity of their marketing department. They may have somebody in there that's an SEO expert or a paid search expert, but how do you essentially mold and form to what their needs are so you can just deliver exceptional work? Absolutely. But yeah, I would call out, hey, yeah, we're not, you know, we're, we're not experts at this. We're not, you know, good at these things. And also too, I think it's important for people to realize the language that people use, they might mean something completely different. We just had an instance where somebody was talking about email marketing, but they were using a CRM. Am I accurate in saying that? Yep. Yeah. yeah. And we lost 
a piece of a deal, not the entire deal, because of that difference, right? So you'll have people that are continually saying, you know, I want, you know, uh, I want digital ads. I want digital ads. I want digital ads, right? And they they could be talking about SEO because you haven't unpacked essentially that they have no idea what digital ads are or how, you know, the internet even works from a search or sponsored uh, standpoint. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, clarity is key. Um, and sometimes, you know, when the client brings it to you with invalid lingo or other, you know, it's it's hard. Like. I'm on the call and he's talking, you know, CRM, CRM. And I'm like, hey, we already kind of have you a CRM. We're like, what do you? And so because I I wasn't unable to to figure out what he was really meaning, he went and found somebody else. And then when he comes back to us and says, hey, we're, you know, consulted with this person. I'm like, wait, all you wanted was email marketing? Like, we that, you know, so that's fine. It is what it is. But definitely sometimes, you know, you got to find understand what the client's really looking for and ask the right questions. I, you know, I missed, that was a, a rare miss, rare miss for me. But I'll, I'll give you credit for that. <laughs> was, wasn't trying to point out the miss. No, no, it's good because I, you know what? I was, I love this. I was reminded, I was pitching some of the other day. And then in our sales process, I have where um, we, we uh, uh, verbalize pricing and whatnot. We like talk through it. Um, and then based on the way that we do discoveries, I have a spreadsheet that I go through that shows essentially where hours are allocated for the individual service lines, right? So we have in there, we're, we're, it's going to take us time to put interview questions together for research. We're going to, you know, look at your site speed SEO. So I go through all those things when we're going to, you know, build a digital strategy. I just gave this guy like a, a ballpark kind of thing over the phone and then he went dark. And going back to what I even said earlier, like, all right, reflecting on like, why, why did I lose that, right? It's like, yeah, I didn't follow my process. Like, I have a really awesome process. We have a solid process for the way that we go about it. And I was like, I didn't do that. So I deserve to lose when everything else has led in experience wise to, to making sure that that is something that is concrete and should be in every step forward. And I didn't follow it. And now, yeah, you know, it what's that? Is it written down? It is written down, absolutely. Is it in our process document? No, I tattooed it to my wife's back. Nice. Yeah. Um, you know, that is something I definitely wanted to bring up in regards to scaling is, um, you know, we just, just in our account management meeting uh, this week, talked about, you know, a re an error that got repeated. And it was a long time since the last time it happened, but it happened. And I'm like, guys, do we have this written down? Is this, you know, what's the process and why? Because I'm in my head thinking, what happens when I have a hundred people under me doing SEO? You know, I, I can't hand, we can't have a manager for every person and overseeing this. So we have to have things written down in a process that people can follow so that when they say, Hey, what do I do? You go follow the process. It's right here. And here's a link. This is what you do every single time. And, you know, so bringing that to like scalability, you know, the only way you're going to be able to scale beyond what, 15, 20 people is if you have your processes written down so that you, you don't have to be there. I mean, I can't believe like we started this podcast, what, in January, right? It was something like that. Yeah. January, or December last year, almost a year. Yeah. And Gabe was number four. Number four. Yeah. And I am just, I am the process man now. Like I, I cannot believe how much I enjoy, like how much I refer to our process document ever since interviewing Gabe. Like that was the most impactful golden nugget for this year for me by far. And so building out processes, the way that we do it, it's the individuals that essentially that have the process, write the process. Correct. Right. Oh. I think that's, that's something I think that we, we could, we could work on to figure out how can we get more processes, you know? And, and not only that, your process document needs to have a process of how to amend the process document. I'll and say that have, again. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that that's literally What's step the process two. For the process? Yeah. Step two in our process document is how to amend the process document. I mean, it's it's like our company's constitution. It's like this is how this is what Oyova is. Mm -hmm. And 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 you know, it has to evolve and it, and it has to be able to be changed. And as things change and how we do business changes, but if it's not written down, then you don't have anything. You're just I a collection of people. Like orientation videos. Did you ever have a job? You worked at a pizza place or something, right? Yeah. 
did they what was orientation like for that did they sit you down into a room and just make you like watch a video no but i did get a job at giant eagle when i was in uh uh living in uh like pennsylvania area and um they were a union so in order i mean they they're their onboarding was like two days of the most boring as fuck videos of how to like sweep, how to bag things. It was like mind draining. I quit after two days. I couldn't do it. I was like, that's what I'm talking about. So there's the balance, right? Of how do we create processes? So people are still creative thinkers as well as uh, able to, to get the work done. And the way that I look at it is, is if this is a problem that we have solved before using our, company's brain trust and we mm -hmm. don't need to solve again for whatever reason then that's something that is a process that we should write the issue is the habit creating it right i think you're really good about it but i'd say for a lot of us it's it's not it's not something that that, that is a habit and even yeah. with revital yeah. like we, we created like all these processes all these things and there's also the infrastructure and management to make sure that those things are happening which is important i think People just realize, like, oh, if I write it down, it's going to happen. No, you need to be conditioned where you have to confront somebody and tell them, like, this is our process. Why didn't that happen? I mean, I just enjoy uh, the, the rules of it. Uh, like, it's like creating laws. I don't know. We just got a comment that somebody wanted to see what it looked like. So I'm looking it up real quick. So hopefully I can give a glimpse of it. I got it, Handy. Do you? All right. Yeah, the process talking. Can I can I share my screen? Yeah, you sure can. All right, let's do this. Let's do. All right, here we go. Look at that. I got it more handy than you. Ha -ha. Right. Well, I'm in a different browser, and that's what was. Sure. Going. All right, let me do this. All right, so how do I do this? It's in a different tab. So. It's not, so if somebody's just listening to the audio. Of this. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how I can share it. Oh, there you go. Share screen. There we go. Share screen is easiest with two monitors. By the way, it is. So, Jennifer, just to answer your question, it is just a Google document, um, but I make sure that the the format is is really set well so that you can use the index uh, really quickly. And once he shares it, we'll we'll go over it. Can you see it? No. Oh, we got to add it to the stream. Boom. Oh, what the hell? It just kicked me out. It's gonna show my accounts. Wow. Now can you see it? It's loading a little slow. Yes. So uh, why doesn't it show the uh, the, the index? It's still loading. It'll get there. I mean, we're, we're chewing up a lot of bandwidth. There's actually a tropical storm going on here, too. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this is essentially it. I think, your, yeah. Yeah, I think your window is just not large enough. But on my screen, uh, on the right, Google Drive will bring in an index. Whoa. And... Um, and so basically I have this document locked from editing, but people can, you know, just like the Google docs, uh, option, um, you know, they can highlight and, and suggest changes, which then comes to me. And then I review them, make sure the wording's right, make sure the rules, right. And then I, um, you know, make the amendment change. And so this has worked really well. We refer to it all the time. At least once a week, something gets edited or updated. Um, so what, we're up to like 47 pages now of process. I mean, we've grouped it in. Oh, you see the thing on the left? Can you open that up? On the left? Yeah, isn't there like a gray bar? Hold on. Let me. I got it. Yeah. So this is the key right here. This is what makes it easy to use as a... Um, as a tool yeah yeah i mean I, I can go real quickly and see all the topics that we're talking about it's organized into major groups you know which are accounting account management or actually sorry yeah human resources accounting account management production teams sales and i think that's it and then they d delve into the details and anytime we run into something that's considered a repeatable process Boom, it's going in the process document. That's how we scale. You know, I don't think I have, I, I got to add some of the stuff to, to sales here. Eh, sales calls. But to all DMG members, you'll get a copy of this because I'll go ahead and publish it to the, the Slack group. So 
Jennifer, you can do whatever you want with this. I may strip out some things that don't make sense. Like I saw some some like places to email and things like that. Um, so I'll create a copy so you guys can uh, do what you want with it. And I hope it helps your agency. Yeah. Boom. That is the process document. And that I think is a key key to scaling. It's processes. And remember, as Dave says, don't forget to write the process for your process. It'd be a good t-shirt. Processception. The process within the process. Perception. perception. Uh, is there anything that we should cover for, for scaling that we may have glossed over? Um, hmm. And I know a lot of this comes from our experience, essentially how we're doing it. We've spoke with some fantastic people. Process is one of them. Um, and, and then the teams covers everything, you know, because like hiring is a process and, you know, everything we do is a process. So that's how you scale. I mean, I say process you know. and culture. Yes. Yeah. Because essentially, you know, people that like each other or that are like each other right and how do they go about doing whatever it is that they do right and then the process is as uh, essentially the agreement on you know how, how we're going to do it yeah and the transparency you know yeah. I, everyone so everyone is allowed to look at this every team every team member every group and because everything another group might do impacts your group as well in some roundabout way so you might as well be you know, and informed on what they're doing. I think it's important too that not a lot of companies mention because um, it's like, oh, well, I don't want them seeing that. If you have anybody on your team that you're worried about them doing something nefarious with whatever your information is, you should have that person on your team. Right. Also, so, you don't put sensitive information in your process document. I mean, keep it keep it a generic rule because because it's if it's too detailed, then there's room for somebody to misinterpret it. So it's it's general guidance on how to do things. It's I dig it. And if you want a copy of that process document, go ahead and shoot me an email. John, J-O-N at digitalmastermind.com. Other than that, I think that's all we got, my friend. All right. Uh, any last final scalability tidbits? Ooh, I got one more. I do too. Go ahead. Go for it. I think it's something that, that's always missed execute the basics that's all these things are just continually execute the basics and you'll be fine at whatever it is that you do yeah 100 actually i think we should leave it on that note that was a strong close <laughs> <laughs> all right well everybody thank you so much and if you'd like to uh, go ahead and, and join john uh send me an email john j-o-n at digitalmastermind.com also Subscribe, share, comment. Jennifer was fantastic today. Uh, great questions and great input. And we'll see you next time. Thank